Hello, we're happy to show you the PAT Billiard Training Program with the help of this DVD. I feel especially grateful for the assistance of this film studio, or rather the Billiard Academy Dachau. Yes, and a big hello from me as well, and I hope you enjoy learning about billiard with us. Let's start. Before we even play a ball, we first want to talk about correct posture. Andreas will tell you some more about it. I would like to start by showing you one of the classic problems that most billiard players have, who have either learned the game from a coach or who have taught themselves. The problem begins when I take a so-called textbook stance. I've positioned myself quite well, at least it looks that way. But when I stand up straight and let my arm hang loosely, then I notice that my cue points in a totally different direction all by itself. That means that later in the game, my cue will tend to pull a little to the right. I might inadvertently put a little right English on the ball or simply miss shots. And exactly this natural or instinctive direction, which my cue will take after the stroke, is what we have to determine before we make the stroke. To determine this, we use the following procedure. We try to find the center of gravity, or the balance point of our cue, then grip the cue exactly at this point, not too hard, but just enough that it doesn't slip out of your hand. And now, here's the difficult part. Let's say we want to sink this ball, so we take position in front of the table, our legs parallel to the table, and then, this won't be easy, we relax. This is the hard part, to let go. And then we suddenly realize that our cue goes into a totally different direction. Do you see that? If I push a bit against the cue, it will always take its natural position, which is different and individual for each person. Therefore, you can't say this or that stance is the one and only correct one, and you have to stand with this or that angle to the table. It's really something very individual. So, when we have accomplished that, and I want to perform a straight shot, I have to change my stance as if the cue is aiming. I have to turn and keep turning until the cue lines up with the shot. And if I do this, the cue will be straight by itself. I don't have to do anything by myself. Now the tricky part is going from this upright stance down to the table to play. To do that, I reach back to the grip tape and take a step forward. But that's easier said than done. That's why we have a nice little exercise which Andreas will explain to you. As we have heard, taking an anatomically correct stance at the table isn't as easy as one may think. There is an exercise that may look a bit silly at first, but it develops just about everything we need to take an anatomically correct stance in order to shoot straight. We start just as Ralph had explained. We find our cue's balance point and we hold it at that point by laying our hand on the cue at that point, wrapping our fingers around it, not too hard and not too soft. That means that we can hold our cue level without having to squeeze on it. If I turn the cue plumb, then it shouldn't slip out of my hand. But if I pull up with my hand, then it should slip through. We hold the cue just hard enough as necessary. During the game, we will never have to squeeze any tighter on it than this. Now we get to the difficult part that Ralph had mentioned earlier, to relax. You may have noticed that most billiard players don't look very relaxed when they play. Well, apparently, this isn't very easy. We square our shoulders, stand straight and let our arms hang loosely. Immediately we can see how my cue turns noticeably further as it did with Ralph. This is my personal fundamental posture. So now I want to shoot this ball in the pocket. But right now my body is in line with the shot. I am facing in the direction of the shot. The next step is to get my cue in line with the shot at the same time letting the cue hang loosely anatomically correct. So I begin to turn with tiny little steps. A word of caution here. This is a very difficult exercise. Most people begin to turn the cue as they turn themselves. It is not easy to just let the cue hang and turn with your feet until the cue lines up with the shot. Then I walk towards the table, again with very small steps until the end of my cue is over the cue ball. 
eine Position über den Ball eingenommen. Then the most difficult Jetzt part. Das Teil, We leave the cue exactly genau where it is and bend over with our so upper body as far as we would when we usually shoot. And then we just shoot the ball into the pocket. <laughs> this looks terribly easy, but when you practice this for yourself, then you will see that it is not. That's why we would like to offer to you free with this DVD, Andy and Ralph's first workout entitled How can I convince my body to take a correct shooting stance at the table? <laughs> it's a simple exercise that doesn't require more than five, six, ten minutes at the most before each game. Ready or not, here comes Andy and Ralph's first workout. We need a billiard table and we take five balls and we put them in this pocket here and then we take five other balls and put them in the pocket diagonally across from the first. Ralph is taking care of that. Just throw them into the pocket. Good. Personally, I think this is the first mandatory exercise for every billiard player, because you can learn so much by just doing this exercise. We take a ball out of the pocket, place it at the first diamond about half a diamond away from the long cushion, we pick up the chalk, the chalk is very important, then we chalk up our cue, set the chalk down, and then we go into our starting position. We step back from the table and face in the direction of our shot. We hold our cue at its balance point, then we turn so that the cue is in line with the shot, then we walk to the table until the tip of the cue is over the ball, bend over and shoot the ball in the pocket. Then we pick up the chalk and we walk. Walking is important because we have to learn to develop an easy, steady rhythm in our game. A steady pace between each ball, not running from one to the next. The cue is over the ball and then it stays where it is. Bend with your upper body, shoot the ball in the pocket, pick up the chalk and keep on walking. Find your own personal rhythm for your movement. Billiard is like a dance, it is motion. You express yourself at the table. Now let's discuss some of the difficulties that may arise. We do everything correctly, we turn correctly and we are standing properly. You are going to notice that I am going to try to shoot the ball, but it won't work. I won't be able to intentionally sink this easy ball because what happens, oh, I completely miss the ball. This can happen, so what do we do now? We smile. Then we pick up the ball and we pick up the chalk and we walk. We only try to shoot each ball once. Smiling is very important. Making mistakes is part of playing games. We could also occasionally miss the pocket. Pick up the ball, pick up the chalk, smile, keep going. We keep doing this until the five balls that were in this pocket are in that pocket. And the five balls that were in that pocket are in this pocket. Now we get to the revolutionary, new addition to this exercise. We do the whole exercise again backwards. Because we also want to get used to playing along the cushion on the right hand side. Then we go into our starting position, we turn so that the cue is in line with the shot, move forwards until the cue is over the ball, bend down with our upper body, the ball is gone. Pick up the chalk and we walk. We walk tall with a steady pace suitable for the game. Then we take out a ball. We get into position, we turn to shoot, move into the ball, bend down, shoot the ball in the pocket, pick up the chalk and so on and so forth. In summary, let's review what we are training through this exercise. We are teaching our body to automatically take a correct stance at the table. It seems like a strange exercise in the beginning. You may ask yourself, what does this have to do with billiard? This is the point of the exercise. Many players try to intentionally work on their stance as they are shooting, to hold their arm right, to have their fingers the right way, to place their feet correctly. In this moment, it can't function anymore. Nobody Nobody can move their body that precisely, especially if they are consciously trying to control each movement. That's why one of the worst things that can happen to you when you're in a billiard salon or somewhere similar and someone feels obliged to say to you, no, you've got your hand wrong, your arm is too, you're facing the wrong way and you've got your feet in the wrong place. All that does is to help the beginner not to learn.
how to play billiards. Or at the best, he stiffens up his game and becomes worse. I think that this is a problem that you are familiar with as well, right? Oh yes, people definitely want to be good. <laughs> the second thing that we learn is to walk. And there is something else that this exercise will help beginners with. You cannot consciously hit this glob of plastic correctly. You may have heard it said, it's just a glob of plastic, doesn't even have a brain, but it can still make the best billiard player look like a fool. If we stand anatomically correct, that means we let the anatomical position of our cue dictate our stance. And we have decided that we really want to hit that ball and we don't cheat, that is, we don't squeeze down on the cue, then there is no chance that you will hit the ball. If you honestly try to do this exercise, then you will see that this is true. The reason for that is quite simple. It takes too long for the deliberate impulses that we think in our brain to reach our arm. This movement has to work automatically, without even thinking about it. That is the real trick to playing good billiard. If the stance is correct, then the stroke will be two. The direction of your stroke will be correct and you will always hit the ball properly. The attempt to exactly hit the ball in a certain way, to move your arm and your wrist, which actually shouldn't move at all, in a certain way, so that you hit the ball in a specific manner, will automatically fail. So now that we have talked about the proper stance, Ralph will talk about developing a good stroke. If we want, for instance, to achieve speed 1, speed 2, speed 3 and speed 4, we have to take care not only of our individual natural position, but after we have taken our stance, then we need the proper strength in our stroke. Someone who swings too slowly, too short, will have problems performing shots that require a lot of speed or strength, like speed 4. If you swing very slowly, that won't work. You need a very fast stroke. The power comes from the speed. The movement doesn't fit if someone swings too slow. The same thing happens when someone swings very, very fast. He probably will have problems with speed 1. You need a consistent stroke, adequate frequency and a good final rhythm. This means I swing as often as I like and when I think I'm ready, then comes one, two, stroke. And the same with speed two. We swing, okay, one, two, stroke. And the same with speed three. Swing, one, two, stroke. And the same with speed four. We take our position, we swing, one, two, stroke. The last one was a bit too hard, but that's why we have a professional to show you how it's done right. Now we just want to take a moment and review what actually happens when we make a stroke. It's important that we begin with our starting position. We step back from the table and face in the direction of our shot. And then, as difficult as this may seem for all the control freaks in billiard, we just rely upon the fact that we have practiced our one-handed exercise five or ten thousand times. Don't let that discourage you. I know it sounds like a lot, but there is no way around it. If we just rely upon this fact and go to the table, we can be confident that the final position that our body automatically takes, because of the exercise we have made, will be correct. Let's get to the next topic, which is working on the effectivity of our stroke. How can we influence the motion of the cue ball through the way that we strike it? For example, if we do not hit it in the middle, but outside its center point, then it gets a certain rotation. How can we use this rotation, develop it? 
First, a few words about the bridge. We've not said anything about that until now. The closed bridge is recommended because with the open bridge, you tend to pull up on the queue. You will see professionals playing with open bridge now and then. This is just because they've been playing for many years with a closed bridge. Through their experience, they are able to play straight with an open bridge. At least in the beginning, there's no way around playing with a closed bridge. A little advice. Put your thumb to the upper joint of your middle finger, then spread the ring finger and the pinky, and then before you add your forefinger, try to find a hollow where the cue can slide freely and then add your forefinger. This is similar to playing with the open bridge. Your forefinger shouldn't interfere with the cue or press on it. This wouldn't be good. Well, let's start with stop shots. On a stop shot, the cue ball is played just below the center. The cue ball has three phases of motion when we play the white ball low. During the first phase, it has a backspin. Then, in the second phase, it slides. And finally, the phase where it rolls naturally. Now, we want to shoot the cue ball so that it's in the second phase, the sliding phase, when it contacts the object ball. So we play just below the middle, and otherwise finish the stroke normally. Let's come to follow shots. Follow shots, we shoot the cue ball aiming above the middle and then follow through. And now, can you just give me that? Then we come to draw shots, aiming somewhere between just below the middle and very low, and then follow through. You see, when I follow through and see the white ball coming back to the queue, I move the queue aside instead of pulling it back because with draw shots, you tend to pull the cue back and not follow through on the stroke. To learn the draw shot, you may think it looks quite easy. But in order to learn it really well, you don't have to do a lot of different exercises. There is a much more clever way to learn stop shots. Actually, all these shots, stop shots, draw shots, and follow shots, with one exercise. You just have to stick it out. You have to shoot a lot of balls, a lot, about five to fifteen thousand. This is common with sports that demand a high level of precision and skillfulness. Billiard is one of these sports, unfortunately, a sport that demands skills that one achieves through repetition, shooting again and again. Now Andreas will show you an exercise which is necessary for that. As Ralph has said, we want to discuss another exercise in order to work on stroke effectivity. He said quite often that it is important to follow through on your stroke. We want to take a look at that again. Before we look at the exercise as a whole, let's examine a few important details. More experienced viewers have probably noticed that until now we haven't spoken about things like 90 degree angle at the elbow or how exactly one should hold the cue. The funny thing about that is that the one-handed exercise inevitably takes care of all that. I can only hold the cue right if I have my 90 degree angle here naturally. Anything else would consequently send my cue in another direction, up or down. That means that we have deliberately not mentioned those topics because these things will resolve themselves. So before we get to the whole exercise, we take our correct starting position. Then we move into the ball, we set our hand, 
our bridge and then we shoot balls into the pocket. To do this, we have to know when a shot or a stroke is actually finished. To answer this question, we need a little anatomy. Anatomically, I can easily move my arm back and forth in about a 60 degree angle. So if my arm is moving 60 degrees, then I actually form an equilateral triangle, all sides of which are equal. That means that the bottom part of this triangle, which is the length of my stroke, must have the same length as the swinging part of my arm. The length of the swinging part of my arm is measured from the middle of this joint to the middle of this joint, where the Q is. That means if I lay my arm here on the table, a word of caution here, the distance between the bridge and the cue ball that we are depicting here is much shorter than it would regularly be in billiard. Then I can lay my arm on the table and make two marks, and then I have the distance of my stroke when I make an easy, normal stroke. I am about 15 to 20 centimeters in front of the ball, stroke, and if I follow through, then the cue will automatically stop at its anatomical end, approximately at the second mark, here. Experienced players will end up a bit further, but only a little. It's not necessary to follow through further. It's not necessary to follow through with the upper arm either. You can do that if you want to, that shouldn't interfere with anything. If the stroke is straight and your stance is good, then you can follow through with your upper arm without detrimentally affecting your shot. But the natural length of your stroke is this distance here, the distance your forearm swings. So the next detail we have to clear up is how should my stroke look if I later want to shoot with effectivity. We still have our markings here that show us where to set up my bridge, the distance from my bridge to the ball and where I end up when I follow through with my stroke. Now, what would be the best way to move this piece of wood to achieve that? The logical answer? Horizontally. Not as you often see it done with a very steep angle nor do we want a shoveling motion. It should be obvious that we want to hit the ball as level as possible. That means we want to move the cue ball as flat and straight as possible. Flat back and flat forth and as flat as we can to stroke through the ball. So how do we accomplish that? We have a relaxed grip on the cue, so we can't really pound on the ball. Rather, we just want to move the cue through the ball. Perhaps we can compare it to throwing a frisbee or playing with a yo-yo. A frisbee is also something that you hold loosely when you throw it, but you still achieve a high velocity at the end of the throwing motion. The same with a yo-yo, a very soft motion resulting in a comparatively high-end velocity. That is exactly the motion that we need to play billiard, a soft, smooth motion we don't want to jerk or jam the cue. If I jerk the cue, then I'm also stopping short at the end of the motion. I have to use my muscles and then you can immediately see what happens at the tip of my cue. With a jerking motion, I pull the cue to the side and when when that happens, when we shoot, as it has with most of us, it isn't good. So we try to move smoothly. Very smooth motions. As Ralph mentioned before, we can also move more quickly, but always smooth, very soft. And then you stroke through the ball. The important part of the motion is that the backwards motion is slow and then you accelerate through the ball. That means that we will not have reached our highest velocity at ball contact, rather at the end of our stroke. That may sound a little strange, as if we would want to run with full speed against the wall, but this isn't the case. It just means that the stroke will stop itself because it got to the anatomical end of the swing. Your joint and the tissue here act as a natural break. We just want to concentrate on the constant acceleration on your stroke. What does that look like? Let's just take our stance before this ball and simply, clean and smooth, as level as possible, go through these balls. The exercise is done as follows. We simply set up 16 balls on the headline. Ralph, can you give me a hand here? 
There are many variations to this exercise. We can either simply shoot the balls or we can practice our starting position and taking our stance at the table with each ball. However we do that, the important part of this exercise is that we train our stroke. The actual contact that the cue makes with the ball, the only instance where you can later influence the game. Every stroke should have the same speed, the same strength, the same end velocity, the same stroke length. To clarify a bit more, I am going to widen the space between my bridge and the ball somewhat. You will see many billiard players doing this. So now I'll make the same shot. I cannot stroke through the ball. My motion is always with a slight downward slant. This cushion is higher than half a ball, which means that a completely horizontal stroke will always be utopian in billiard. Our stroke will always have a slight downward slant. Once again, a wide space between my bridge and the ball. And again. This time I'll miss the pocket so that the ball comes back. The distance from the bridge to the ball needs to be 15 to 20 centimeters wide or about two-thirds of a diamond. Make sure that your bridge hand isn't parallel with the diamond. It should be in front of the diamond in this area, at about two-third or 15 to 20 centimeters. So this is the exercise that Ralph was talking about. 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 balls just to work on your stroke. Always the same amount of power, the same velocity. You can stroke without swinging beforehand, even if the chalk is in the way. Then you can do some with a complete procedure, going into my starting position, then taking my stance at the table, swinging, then the stroke, then again. The cue moves as level as possible and it achieves its highest velocity at the end of the stroke. I'm sure Ralph will agree that this is the method that will help you to develop a stroke with the qualities you need to master all the challenges that you will face in this test or in a normal game. It's important to understand the purpose behind this exercise, not just because of what Andy has told you, but if you play with just one ball, just one ball into the pocket, then it is guaranteed that you concentrate on your stroke. If you play two balls, like in a game, you want to pocket an object ball with a cue ball, then you concentrate much more on the result. Does it fall in the pocket or doesn't it? You do not concentrate as much on the stroke as before. But when you practice with just one ball, these 16 in a row, and you sink one after another, then it is guaranteed that you only concentrate on your stroke. If you do this, then you will develop a good stroke. That's what this is about. It's not just about sinking 5,000, 10,000 or 15,000 balls. It's important that you do not sink them as fast as possible, but as good, as accurately as possible. Otherwise, you may inadvertently practice a bad stroke. And you can imagine what that would mean. You need then another thousand balls to file out these mistakes. Now you have to perform this procedure as accurately as possible, and only then will this exercise be of benefit. And perhaps you should try to get some advice from someone who plays billiard well every couple thousand balls. Just a little checkup. How is my stroke? Is it still okay? Does everything still work all right? Now we get to the first exercise from the pat test. This is the speed exercise. We take the balls one, two, three, four, and we place each ball within the diamond segment. It doesn't matter where they are, just as long as they are within the segment. Okay. 
And then I just play the one, speed one. There, into this field, which is two diamonds from the back cushion wide. It's not important if you hit the short cushion or if you don't. Everything very easy. But don't hit the side cushion. Then speed two. Again, I can place the second ball in this segment of the diamonds. This is what most people can do very well, because it's the shot used to determine who begins the game shooting for break. Usually, we have to get as close to the cushion as possible, but in our test, we just have to stay within the head area. Then, speed three, ball is placed accordingly. Ball three has to end in the same field where we have the one ball, the field designated by the two diamonds, and the four accordingly. Again, it's in the diamond segment, and it has to come back to the two ball, this time with a longer route. And don't forget, if you hit another ball, then it does not count, which means I would have just got three points here, because the four has touched the three. So take care with speed four. And this is a big problem for many people, that also with speed four, the stroke is done straight and accurately. The next exercise, the straightness exercise, is from Torsten. I'll help you set it up. Where's the cue ball? I think we should demonstrate the exercise with just one lane. In the test, there are three lanes next to each other. It, now, the opening here is two balls wide. Billiard balls, not bowling balls. And the cue ball here, this is good. You can always see that when you've placed everything correctly, your cue will automatically be over this diamond. And if it's not, then you know that something is wrong. But now to the exercise. In the test, you have to do three strokes four times. I didn't say 12 strokes, rather 4 times 3. That means, after 3 strokes, you note how many of these 3 you've got. You don't only have to shoot straight through the gap, but to get the point, the white ball has to stay in this field. If it goes too far, like now, it doesn't count, although it was straight. Shoot as if you were shooting for break, close to this cushion. Well, I probably wouldn't get to break, but I got the point. It's still in the field.
You will not have any problems with the effectiveness of your stroke if you've shot 10,000, 15,000 balls as mentioned in the earlier exercise. Then you will certainly not have any problems with follow shots. We have a good stroke. We are hitting the cue ball above the center and letting it follow. You place the balls on the third diamond, the distance between each ball about half a ball wide, and you will get a point for each object ball you sink, and one for positioning the cue ball properly. The position is particularly good if the white ball follows into the pocket, but you will also get a point if it stays in the first diamond field. The white ball should always be placed at a distance of two diamonds from the object ball, as you can see here. One, two diamonds distance, in line with the pocket, then hit it high and follow through correctly, at least until its anatomical end. With additional movement you could extend the stroke, some enjoy extensions quite a lot, and then you continue. You have to perform this exercise three times. Three times it will be noted, one point for each position, one point for each object ball sunk, just how many you were able to achieve. There are 12 possible points for each part. Well, when setting up the balls for draw shots, it is the same as with follow shots, half a ball diameter distance from each other, here on the third diamond, the white ball two diamonds away. You get one point for each ball in the pocket and for each position. That means that if you are not confident enough, then you could just do stop shots and you will get the points for the pocketed balls. But for a position point, you should try to collect some points for position, which is the idea of the exercise. The white ball has to be in this field and, unfortunately, also has to touch the cushion and also stay in this field. And if you have done this 10,000 to 15,000 times, then it will be no problem to perform the same stroke procedure, very low, to follow through. Then 
Then you take the white ball again, place it in line with the pocket, set your bridge, aim low, stroke. When the white ball passes the middle line, it perhaps might be a very good draw shot, but I'm sorry to say you will not get the position point for high spirits. This calls for control, finding the proper amount of speed and backspin. The cue ball has to touch the cushion and stay in this field. Okay, and then we continue. Take your stance, aim, swing, stroke, back, and let it stay in the field. Okay, many mistakes happen with draw shots when people pull the cue back during the stroke. They shorten the stroke. They want to shoot fast and hard, but they jam on the brakes. After 10,000 to 15,000 balls, you will not do this anymore. You will perform your stroke and follow through without even thinking about it. Because you have done it so often, you are used to the movement. That means you really shouldn't have to practice draw shots that much to learn them. This will be automatic. Draw back the white ball, play it low. Now we still have one more. I always follow through until the anatomical end of my stroke, even if the cue ball comes back to the cue. Most often it passes on the right or left side. But even if it comes back to the cue, I don't pull back. Rather, I pull aside. I have enough time to react if this should happen. Up until now, we have only been doing straight shots in our exercises where the object ball, that is the colored ball, is in line with the cue ball and the pocket. Now we want to do some exercises where the balls are not in a straight line. A problem that often arises, especially amongst beginners, is that aiming at the ball seems quite simple. When deciding where I want to aim the cue and I want the 11 to go here, then I have to hit it at this point, though if I aim at this point, then I'll miss. You can observe this in billiard salons that this is a very common problem, especially with untrained players, because it would seem like I had aimed properly. Now we want to figure out where I really have to aim to make this shot. As I said before, clearly I have to hit the ball here. 
The problem is that the cue ball is not a point, rather it is a sphere. That means that I'm shooting a sphere at that point on the 11 and I hit a different point than I had aimed at. In this case, I hit a point to the right of where I had aimed. To accurately aim at that point on the 11, I have to imagine a ball at the point of contact. I have to imagine where the cue ball must be at the moment that it hits the 11 on that point. Because this ball exists only in our imagination, we call it the ghost ball. It's not really there. We are aiming the cue ball, which really exists here on the table, at the middle of a ball, an imaginary ball, the ghost ball, that we see with our mind's eye at the point of contact. We are actually aiming at a point, a half of a ball width away from the point of contact. For the first exercise you need five balls, and you place them in a semicircle around the middle pocket. To set them up accurately, make sure that the outside edge of the middle ball is in line with this diamond here, and that the outside edge of the inner ball is in line with the half diamond, and the same here and here, the outside edge in line with about half a diamond, and then you will have it set up right. To begin, you place the white ball, I would suggest, at a short distance. Place it in line with the middle of the pocket, but you don't want to shoot it straight into the pocket. Don't aim exactly straight at the center of the pocket, but play it a little bit to the right-hand side. Then, a light draw shot, bring the cue ball back, it will take this angle by itself. This was a bit too far, so I have to reduce my speed. Now I have a straight shot again, but I don't play it straight, rather with a slight angle to the right. And again, I do a draw shot. Now, if I shoot straight, I would hit this corner. But since I want to aim a little bit to the right, it should be okay. Now it's a straight shot again. I play it a little bit to the right. Now it's straight again, a little bit to the right. Then it will fall into the pocket. You see, I can play without English during this exercise. English, or a side spin, is mentioned in pad two. Then we will want to talk about that more in detail. So the next exercise, which is also a part of test one, is the exercise where we place five balls here. Press together. And the principle is the same. To get a good angle, we just place the ball here. Okay. And then we do a draw shot, uh, a mini draw shot. Again, we have a small angle, and now it is straight. So I play it a little bit to the left side of the pocket, so the cue ball comes back a little to the right. Again, a straight shot. I'll aim a little to the left, so the cue ball comes back with a proper angle. And now the last one. You can perform this without any English, which we will talk about in Pat 2. Now it's important that you play draw shots with the right speed and the right amount of backspin. Let's watch Torsten how he manages this exercise.
Now we come to the next part of our little test, which is the large position area, that is playing position over large area. Principally, we distinguish between the small and the large position area. In the small area, we have to deal with reduced speeds, the distance which the white ball runs are shorter, and this is very important when playing 14-1 or 8-ball. Then we have the large position area, where the cue ball travels larger distances from one half of the table to the other at higher speeds, so it makes sense to talk about two different position areas. Concerning the exercises in the large area, we talk about three important things that you need to play successfully. First, you need a feeling for speed. Second, you have to be able to predict the natural course of the cue ball without English and where does the white ball go with the help of tangents. Tangents are necessary to determine direction. Once again, tangents, natural courses and a correct feeling for speed. Andreas will now explain some of the details. Ralph mentioned tangents. You read about them in billiard books or you will hear about things like the kiss shot tangents. The mystery behind tangents is nothing more than simple physics. Newton, for example, wrote a number of essays about mechanical processes and one of them is called for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. That basically means that every action that I cause object B to do with object A will also have an equal reaction on object A. That means that when two balls contact ideally, then they separate in a 90 degree angle. First, we visualize our ghost ball. Let me just check and see if it's positioned right. The kiss shot tangent rule tells us that when I visualize a line between the center points of these two balls and at the point on that line where the two balls meet, I envision a tangent, a line perpendicular or at a 90 degree angle to the first. Then the cue ball must run along this line if it contacts the object ball ideally. Ideal means that when the cue ball hits the object ball, then it is not rolling. It is not rolling at the moment that it hits the object ball. What we are actually speaking about is a stop ball. A stop ball is sliding when it contacts the object ball. It is not rotating. And so the laws of physics will force it into move along this line. That means that when I shoot the ball square into this pocket, that the cue ball will travel along this tangent and hit the cushion around here. So as you see, the ball did come over here. That is the so-called kiss shot tangent or stop ball line, because the cue ball follows that line if shot as a stop ball, if it is sliding as it contacts the object ball. That means that we have put an effect on the ball in order to keep it from rotating when it hits. The nice thing about these tangents is that they are predictable and consistent. That 90 degree angle can be applied anywhere on the table. It is one of the only lines on the table that I can rely on. If I play this ball with a stop shot, then the cue ball will move along this line. This helps me to control the placement of my cue ball quite accurately. Of course, I won't always play a stop shot, which means that I will deviate from this line. My cue ball will not travel along this line. Ralph mentioned earlier the natural roll of the ball, that is, striking the ball without putting an effect on the ball. Some call it pushing the ball. 
But that would still mean that we want to have a good stroke, not just giving it a nudge, rather a good stroke and let the ball roll, not too hard, and here we see the cue ball does something completely different. It rolled out of the kiss shot tangent line and rolled forward into the cushion, a totally different direction. We see that there's a lot of variation as to how the ball can travel. This is something you have to learn quickly. Players have to know where the ball is going to when it rolls naturally. Ralph will speak more about that when we get to the exercises. There are two other possibilities how we can influence where the cue ball travels. Both have to do with the effect that we put on the ball. The first method is to put forward spin on the ball. That means that we are causing the ball to rotate in the direction that it is traveling, but at a higher number of revolutions than its natural roll. We are shooting a follow shot. The ball is actually sliding with a forward spin on it. After contact, it must start to travel along the tangent until the forward spin gets grip on the felt and then pulls it away from the kiss shot tangent and into the cushion. Let's take a look at that. I'm shooting a follow shot. So we see that in this particular case there is not a big difference between the natural roll and the follow shot. You first really see the difference when the cue ball rolls over long distances. The ball shot without effect, struck in the middle, would take a straight course over here and keep rolling in that direction, whereas the follow shot would start to travel the kiss shot tangent until the forward rotation would start to grip the felt. The ball would stop sliding and begin to roll much more directly in line with our stroke. We will be able to see this better during the exercises how balls with natural rolls travel completely different paths as balls with a forward spin. So it must be obvious what will happen when I put a backspin on the ball. After it contacts the object ball, it will begin to go along the tangent line until the backward spin grips the felt and the ball rolls backwards away from the line. It won't move constantly along the line, rather it will back away from it. Depending upon how much backspin I put on the ball, it will determine how soon the ball will leave the tangent line and how hard or sharp the curve will be. So let's do a draw shot. So we see that there was quite a bit of backspin on the ball. It slid a little to the side and then rolled back immediately. With these shooting methods we have a wide range of positions that we can play on the table. We have the natural roll that will run in this direction. We have our follow shots that run in this direction or in this direction. Then we have our stop shots that we can control very well ending up around here. Now we have also seen the draw shots that can bring the cue ball back here so that we can actually cover this whole part of the table with draw shots. Let's put a little less effect, not so much backspin, on this ball. Then we move into this area, clearly behind the kiss shot tangent, but not nearly as far back as the previous draw shot. Let's take a look at some exercises to see how we can apply this. First, I'll set up the exercise. We take the numbers on the balls into consideration when we set up the drill because we will have to shoot them in a certain order. One, two, three, four, five and six. I start here with the one. I can put the cue ball where I want, but I'm only allowed to use this pocket. Therefore, I choose a slight angle the tangent would lead me close to the middle pocket. This is a bit too dangerous, so I play just below the middle with a little backspin so that the cue ball is here for the two ball. Now, as you can see, I was very low, my angle was too steep, 
Perhaps it would have been more comfortable there, but nevertheless it was still okay. Next, we want the two in this pocket, and now I let the cue ball roll naturally. The tangent would lead me again to this pocket or close to the pocket, so that the natural roll would even intersect with the tangent, hit the cushion, this cushion, and then away from it. And now I have almost an ideal angle. Now I can use the tangent again, because the tangent is pointing there. This is quite good, then the ball will roll back here, and I have a quite good position on the four ball. The same is possible again with the four, because I have almost the same angle. The tangent is about, if I can see that correctly, yes, about there. And then, if it rolls accordingly, I get a good position to the five. To send the cue ball along the tangent, you have to, as Andrea said before, play a stop shot. And now we have the five. Here the tangent is almost a straight one. Yes, this means I could go there with just one more stop shot. To avoid that, it goes too far, I play a little bit lower, and then it takes this course. Not too low, otherwise we get close to the middle pocket. And the six should be no problem. And now we'll watch Torsten how a world champion will solve this. And now, there is the second exercise, which is important for the large position area. You set up the balls like this. By the way, the ball which is close to the cushion, this is also important for the previous exercise, is about half a ball away from the cushion. The foot spot, head spot, and these in between. Use the correct ball numbers. One, two, three, four, Five, six. The advantage here, for these three balls, you may use these two corner pockets, and for those three, the foot corner pockets. You are not just limited to one corner pocket, which would not make it easier, of course. But technically, the exercise is the same. We follow Andreas' instructions here too, so it's not necessary that I play it again. We'll just watch Torsten and see how our world champion does it.
The next topic is playing balls that are frozen at the cushion. When it comes to playing position, it is similar to the large area. But what is exactly, or how can we apply these principles that we've learned, these tangents, natural courses, and a feel for speed? Again, a short explanation. First, we're going to take the liberty of saying that when we shoot at frozen balls, and with frozen balls, we're talking about balls in this instance that are directly touching the cushion. When we shoot at this frozen ball, then we want to hit the ball and the cushion simultaneously. I know, I know, I'm sure there are lots of people thinking to themselves that it's physically impossible, it's not possible to hit both of them at exactly the same time. We know this, but for explanation reasons, we're just going to take the liberty of saying this in the beginning, it doesn't make much of a difference anyway as long as we hit them at almost the same time. At the moment we also don't want to address the issue of should I hit the cushion first or the ball first? Perhaps just one small tip for shots at a relatively shallow angle. To hit the ball at the cushion at about the same time, you aim at the point from the player's perspective where the ball touches the cushion. In other words, looking at the ball from here, the point at which it touches the cushion seems to be farther forward as it really is, which can be observed by looking directly from above. So, for shots at relatively shallow angles, up to 30 degrees, if you aim at the point from the player's perspective where the ball touches the cushion, then you should hit both, ball and cushion, somewhat simultaneously. We really don't want to address topics like what is when I hit the cushion first? What if I hit the ball first? What about English? No, we don't want to even get close to that subject right now. We just want to take a look at our tangents again. The tangent for this shot, if I hit both at the same time, then the cue is sent into the cushion, so the ball should come straight out over the table. So, a stop shot, and the cue runs relatively straight across the table. That means, without having to be an expert physicist, that I have my tangent and two other possibilities as well. I can either send the cue ball ahead of the tangent. To do that, I play a follow shot and the forward spin drives the cue ball ahead of the tangent. That is to say, the cue ball slides a bit along the tangent and then spins forward. And the other possibility is to play a draw shot shooting the cue ball below the center, putting backspin on it. Everyone should know what will happen. We have our tangent here. The ball will spin backwards away from the tangent. It will either make a long curve back to me, or, if I hit it really well, then it will come directly back to me. I didn't put too much backspin on that. The way that it went, I could have put more backspin, more effect on the ball. Now we will see the same thing again, just that the ball will come back to us with much more noticeable curve. Just like we did with our tangent exercise before. We have a straight line across the table when we shoot the cue in the middle. Everything in front of this line we achieve by shooting the cue ball high or using its natural roll. Everything behind this line, we hit the cue ball low. It would be good if we take a look at the exercise now. Well, let's set up this exercise. It is relevant for test one. We have two exercises which are relevant for this test. This is the first one. We start with ball in hand. We can put the cue ball wherever we want. During your training, you can find out what the best way is for you to start. You don't always have to copy the way I begin, 
but rather try to find your own way. Experiment. This is an essential part of training. Okay. At the beginning, I prefer to use the natural course the ball takes. I play the ball into the pocket and let the cue ball go where it wants. Then I decide here with a two, if I let the cue ball roll its natural course, it will end close to the cushion. Here I would prefer the tangent, make a stop shot, not too hard, so that it doesn't go too far. With this ball, if I choose the natural course, it would be a bit narrow, and I cannot say whether I can get through here or if I would hit the 12. In this case, to play safely, I also take the tangent, which is here. And if I control my speed, I certainly will get a good position on the 13. And now from here to shoot the 13, the tangent to the 13 is about here. Unfortunately, this doesn't help much, unless I want to play the 5 long. But here I'd better play a good draw shot, and the better I play it, the more it takes me into this direction, so that I don't get close to this cushion. So, now I play the 13. And now I have the 5 ball. The tangent will take me there, almost to the 12. But this is narrow again, I would say. Therefore, a bit below the middle, a light stop shot to get position on the 12. Now we'll watch Torsten again, and we will see how a world champion will manage this exercise. Now let's do the second exercise that is part of our frozen rail drills. It's done with 10 balls. We'll set them up. Four balls on each long cushion. Each ball like this on a diamond. And one ball on each short cushion right in the middle. We don't play ball in hand here. Rather, we set the cue ball where the lines from the center pocket and the first diamonds intersect. You can choose which side you want to begin on. Small children that can't reach the cue ball when it's lined up with the center pocket are allowed, uh, you know you can't be too young to start learning billiard, uh, 
they're allowed to move it somewhat to the side. Technically, the principles of the exercise are the same, so we won't demonstrate it, we'll just watch our world champion solve this. So let's get to the next exercise, the endless drill. Technically, we still work with a large position area. Most often, the white ball has to go far distances, from one half of the table to the other, to reach position. This continues endlessly, the 7, 8, and the 9. This means you don't finish with the 9, but when you play the 9, you try to get position with the cue ball to the 7 even when it's not there. Then it will come back out, as well as the 8 and the 9, and so on. 7, 8, 9, 7, 8, 9, endlessly. This explains the name of the drill. There are also different kinds of endless drills. This is, from a technical point of view, as mentioned before, only a large position area drill. But in addition, there's a small psychological component. If you deal with the endless drill and make a little mistake, like misplaying a ball, this means that you do not only misplay this ball, or the two that are still on the table, you will also misplay all balls that in theory could have come afterwards, and that could be a lot of balls. This means that there is more pressure to make each ball. And the other way around, if you didn't position your cue ball well and have a more complicated shot, then there is much more at stake than just one point for sinking this ball. If you sink this ball, you will not only win just this point, but also all the balls that you can sink afterwards. And this can be an infinite number, but of course it is limited in the test. For the test, we have a limited number of three tables, each with nine balls that can be cleared. Therefore, 9, 9, 9 would be the maximum result. I will not try this now, but we're going to watch Torsten and see how he will manage it.
Now we get to the next category, the so-called standard shots. There are also standard position shots, which we will deal with in PAT 2. Here we are going to deal with standard shots, which means that we simply want to hit balls and sink them. You don't have to play a special position with the cue ball. By the way, the term standard shots it does not mean that they are very easy to do. Rather, it means that it is a standard situation. This is a ball that can occur very often. We will practice now the more difficult distant balls so that you are able to deal with the shorter ones more easily. One of these, I place one of these here. And before we watch Torsten play five balls, I can explain a couple things using this ball. Because standard shots are justified through the fact that when explaining one, uh, we can explain the complete technical shooting procedure. What are we actually doing when we shoot? For each ball, when we want to shoot, we can separate the whole procedure into seven steps. And they can help us quite a lot. Later we will talk about the details. Roughly, when I talk about dividing my shooting into seven steps, then I mean the following. The first step is getting a perspective. That is, I'm standing here, player, ball, corner pocket, in line, and I try to get this perspective, also the perspective for the next position, in case I would play position. And then I chalk, this was the first step. The second step is this. Before I take my stance, I imagine what should happen now. In my mind, I see the ball sink. This takes about a second or two, it depends. And it is important that you really have these images in your mind, because the brain works with images. Your brain then controls your motor functions according to these images, to make them real. You've certainly had the experience that if you play a ball too thin and you scratch, then you say, ah, I knew I would scratch. And then it happened exactly like this. You had this picture in your mind before, how you scratch and your movements adjust so that exactly this would happen. So we take our first step, uh, take our perspective. Second step, imagine what should happen. Third, I take my stance. Fourth, start to check and to aim. We say aim, but actually we're only checking things out, if it's okay or not, or if, if there's a problem. Uh, it would be bad to adjust anything now. So, step three, we go down, take our stance, control, swing the cue. You can do this as long as you want, but usually when I think I've got the right moment, then I get into the final moment and the fifth, the fifth step is then the stroke. Sixth, keep down. Seventh, step back from the table. And then you start again with step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And how this works in detail is what Andy will explain once more, and I guess he will get into some more detail. Good. Let's take a look at this problem again. How do I play a ball and at the same time play position on another ball? Ralph just mentioned that there is a system or a procedure how to work through a shot, how to work through a situation. This will play a very large role in the upcoming tests and DVDs because we are trying to pack all of our training and exercises into the situation before us on the billiard table. Our calmness and our concentration inhabits this shooting procedure. They are dependent on this procedure. That means that the only way to bring a rhythm into your game is to constantly shoot according to the seven-step system that Ralph described. Let's divide the procedure up again into individual blocks. Ralph said we need to get our perspective. Let's say that this first block is about collecting information. I like to call this our spy. The spy doesn't really know what to do outside of the fact that he should collect information. The information that we need to process in our head is the view. 
the perspective over the object ball and into the pocket. A lot of players will try to visualize the ball actually falling into the pocket. They try to visualize the speed of the motions. This is information that our brain can process extraordinary well because our brains work with pictures and not with technical statistics or reference manuals. It works with pictures and with sounds and with feelings. The next thing we have to take a look at is the view from the cue ball to the object ball. You don't have to find the exact spot on the object ball that you want to hit or look for a little mark on the ball to aim at. This is about practice, habit, things we are accustomed to. In the course of time, you learn to see the shot. We have already heard that trying to aim and shoot extremely concentrated and so precise and so exact is next to impossible. What I'm trying to say is that you need a good portion of self-confidence when you play billiard, confidence in your abilities. When I have my first perspective, that means that I look at the ball, not at some point on the ball that I want to hit. And then I change to my second perspective behind the cue ball. And then you must have enough confidence to say, what I am doing is fine. None of us concentrate on walking when we walk. And that is why usually nothing ever happens when we walk. If we did start to think about it, then we would probably fall quite a bit we would at least stumble. This is something you will often see when someone learns to walk for the second time as an adult. Someone who has lost the ability to walk, perhaps through illness, and must learn to walk again. It is unbelievably difficult to regain the self-confidence to simply walk. That same self-confidence is what we need to get the ball into the pocket. So that means that the first thing we need is information. Our spy collects information. If we want to play position, then our spy may they have to gather a third piece of information. And that's not, I need some kind of specific spot that the cue should come to rest on. It is very dangerous to try to play to a point. It's too easy to miss a specific spot on this huge table. It is much more sensible to determine my next perspective. How do I want to see my next ball? Which perspective do I want to see it from? Do I want to have an angle to the lower half of the table or to the upper half of the table? I'm gathering perspectives, pictures that my subconscious can work with much better than with that point. Sometimes that may be necessary, but we should try to avoid playing positions to a specific point as much as possible. There's risk involved with playing to specific points. You can miss specific points on the table. That leads to frustration. That leads to discontentment. Good. Our spy gathered information. He took a couple of pictures, got some perspectives. Our subconscious can now use these perspectives to calculate or visualize every possible direction that we can make the cue ball go. As we have learned, we have our tangent system, the different directions that the ball can take, and how we can stray from the tangents. So we have our information. The spy puts it all in an envelope and gives it to the general. The general, he doesn't play billiard either, he is the tactician. He opens up the envelope, looks at the files and thinks them through. He makes the plan. That means that we begin to visualize what should happen. Should the cue ball bank off the cushion or should it go directly here? We try to visualize what should happen. The better we visualize it, the better we do it. If we can imagine what our arm will feel like, what our hand will feel like, what it will sound like, how fast the ball will move, then we can copy it very well. It's amazing what billiard players can do, because they can visualize things. The best example is, oh my god, please just don't scratch into the middle pocket. Then of course, you can send that cue ball from any angle perfectly into the center pocket without touching a cushion, because you gave your brain a direct order. Put the cue ball in the center pocket. Okay, and then your brain says, 
says, really? You want the cue ball in the center pocket? Okay, if that's what you want, then we'll do it. And then it happens, without any fear or doubts. And that is exactly how we want to learn to play billiard. Let's say we have to play between two other balls. Then we don't want to concentrate on those inner edges of the balls. Don't think, oh my god, I hope I don't hit one of these balls. Now you have created a picture. The result? Cue ball hits ball. No, look at the space between the balls, the middle of the lane. You want to go through the middle, so you visualize the cue ball going between the two balls. So now I can program myself to produce the desired results. Back to the general. He takes a look at the files and says, of course, pocket the nine and get your position on the one. Here's the picture. Play position. Our subconscious then receives the perspectives that we want to achieve. So then he writes the orders and gives them to the soldier. He is the one that we have been training and training and now it's payday. We are finally going to get our reward for all those thousands of balls that we have practiced. Because up until now, we have not had any influence on our game. We first begin to influence our game when we take this piece of wood, hit the white ball with it so that it hits the colored ball. We only influence it in this one short moment. And that moment must be perfect. Now I have to align my soldier. He can only shoot straight. And he can do that very well. He looks for his direction, over the nine and into the pocket. Then he looks for his starting position, lining up with the shot he wants to make. So this is the starting position that he has been trained to take. And now our soldier feels good because he is standing correctly and he knows that he is going to go to the table, take his stance, swing that piece of wood straight and everything is going to be just fine. And that is just what our soldier does. He marches to the table, takes his stance, and then, here comes the next hurdle, he makes a control check. The word control is a dangerous word. All billiard players want to control. We don't want to scroll through a list of things like, oh, I will hit the ball, or even better than that, hmm, in the year 1703 on the Western Front, I missed the ball just like this, and that is why we lost the West War. No, no, we don't want to do that. We're talking about a sort of passive control, being led from the pictures we have received. We take our stance and start to swing, as Ralph mentioned, it doesn't matter how often. And we look a little, we look a little at the cue ball, a little at the other, and we swing our cue. If nothing negative pops into your head, nothing bad, then that's great. Don't ask, will I make the shot? No, the general assumption is, I will make the shot. My soldier took his starting position, I've taken the correct stance, the ball is going in the pocket. If your hair starts to stand on its ends, then it's over with. There's nothing more to even think about. That means that if our soldier takes his stance, swings, and then says, oh, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't look good, stand up and back away from the table, don't try to correct it. He is still standing with his legs on the same spot. It doesn't matter how often he bends down again, he will always aim poorly. Because if he positions his hands differently, then they will not be the way we have been practicing it and he will miss. We certainly have not been practicing in order to miss. So if our passive control check tells us, bad picture, this does not look good, then both legs away from the table, two steps backward, and then the soldier just has to start again. He says, yes, okay, and then we start again. And if it looks bad again, then we stand up again. It doesn't matter if it's embarrassing to back away from the table again. What matters is to pocket the ball. Good. Our soldier takes his stance. He swings his cue, everything looks good, and then we get to the point that Ralph spoke about earlier, where it all comes to an end, the point of no return. When we have reached this point, and our passive control has brought no negative report, so it must have been positive. Pow! And now we try to separate the stroke from everything we have done up until now. Because with our second basic exercise, the one with 16 balls, we stood there, pow, pow, or swing, swing, 
Pow, we had practiced our stroke. That one small moment when we influence our game, we want to separate from the rest of our stroke procedure. That means our soldier takes his stance, swings, everything looks good, that is it. The point of no return. Everything is good now. Now all I have to do is my basic exercise, which means that my eyes are on the object ball, never on the cue ball. So many players have their eyes on the cue ball. First of all, that is a sign of weakness. If you're looking at the cue ball, then you're going, oh, am I going to make the shot or... No, that is my target. That is what I've got my eye on. Not on the cue ball. The cue ball is not important. That's what I want to hit. So, we have our eyes on the object ball. That is our center. And then it's just basic training. Point of no return. Pull back slowly. Pow! Shot. Everything is good. The ball is gone and we remain over there in our target. We continue to rest in our target. We retain the tension of our stroke at the end of our stroke. Not so that we retain the tension toward the back. No, we retain the tension up front. And we do that until the cue ball has reached its goal, until the cue ball is... If we are playing the cushion, then we retain the tension until the cue ball has reached the cushion, not looking at where the cue went or at something else. No, we looked at all of that beforehand. We will be able to see how good our position was soon enough. So, passive control check good. Point of no return. And now we shoot with our focus up front on the object ball. And the last thing we have to mention that makes the whole thing a bit more complicated is Sorry, but it is the most important thing that we have in billiard, as Ralph mentioned earlier. Now we keep calm. And we only have to do this for the one brief moment between. Point of no return and retaining tension. For this brief moment we maintain calm in spirit. No thoughts, nothing. That is hard to learn, I know. You have to work on it, but it is the best method with maximum quality and maximum success. As you've seen, I've just interrupted my speaking. You can practice this by putting balls on the table, and you can speak out loud if you want to. And at the point of no return, you interrupt your speaking, you interrupt your thinking, until you are finished retaining the tension, and then I am allowed to speak again. This is difficult, I know. We will certainly speak about it again because it is the central problem in billiard. The whole mental aspect of billiard takes place within this event. So now I think I've spoken long enough. I will now give the floor back to Ralph. He should also say something about this subject. It is important. Okay, standard balls. This means you practice the same ball again and again. Always repeat the same ball. Training, training so that you can get used to this procedure. You will learn it by heart. You have always the same ball, always the same movements, procedures, it becomes automatic, routine. You just about memorize it. Let's get to the exercise. In the test, you will have five balls, and you get to shoot each ball three times. And then there will just be noted how many of the three shots you've hit. Let's watch Torsten and see how he plays these balls.
Now we get to the next and final topic, which is actual situations in the game. Technically, according to the test rules, you now have the same rules like a nine ball. You may hit other balls on the table. If your ball does not fall where you wanted it to, and you are lucky and you pocket it anyway somewhere else, this counts too. So the nine ball rules are valid here. Even though the shots will always vary, the procedure is always the same. Drills like these are valuable for developing our skill. Even though the shots will always vary, the procedure is always the same. You get your feedback. Can I do it? Or do I have problems with this or that situation? And if you work on these weak points long enough until you find a solution for them, then that is real training. Of course, this drill is also useful for practicing your seven steps again, or the whole procedure. We are going to do that now. I will just try now to play the complete drill and Andy will comment on what I'll be doing in which part. First he gets his perspectives. The spy is working, he is collecting snapshots of the ball and maybe the next position as well. He's an experienced player so he may actually collect a couple of positions in advance. He gives his pictures to the general. The general makes a plan. He then gives the soldier his orders and the soldier fulfills them. Good. And now there is enough time to see if his position is good. He gathers his perspective on the next ball. The plan has been made and the soldier delivers. He looks at his perspectives again, his ball to hole perspective, as well as the position he wants on the next ball. The general calculates. The soldier receives his orders and good. As you see, players with more experience will do certain steps very quickly or not at all. But that doesn't mean that the step hasn't been practiced. It's more than likely that he's doing all the steps. It's just that some of them are so fast that you hardly notice them. Perspectives have been collected. He has his concept. Execute and retain the tension until the cue ball has reached its goal. Now, many would probably begin to complain, saying, Oh no, the cue ball ended up right next to another ball. He sees the five. It's no big deal. He collects his information and plays. Very nice. You notice how he maintains a rhythm, stoically keeping to his procedure. This often helps to deal with small mistakes better. A lot of the small mistakes that billiard players worry about are not even really mistakes. The six didn't really interfere with the cue. We see how cleanly he's playing. He may not have positioned the cue ball exactly as he wanted to, but nobody will ever do, and it is not important anyway. He collects his perspectives, he imagines the shot, and he plays it. And even here, he takes his time before going to his next ball. I'm sure he'll finish the game. What a good nine ball player. Unbelievable. And now let's watch it again, played by Torsten. I'm sure he has some different ways. I don't remember. Let's just watch a world champion and see how he copes with these problems.
Okay, and now we want to make a point of the fact that this test that we do here, and all the drills we've shown you here, don't have to be the best drills in the world. I know of course that they are really good, but the point is, these are the exercises you will be tested on. Training in general to improve your abilities shouldn't be limited to just these exercises. You can have a great variety, and this would be good. Work on training different skills. Use different drills in your training program. Ask your trainer which exercises he can recommend for practice to improve the skills you need for passing the tests. There should be a great variety in your training program. And in our magazines you will certainly find some more important drills to do that are relevant. In addition, we will offer you a couple of additional drills which you can play alternatively to the drills mentioned before. Let's start with the speed. If you recall, we had these four balls, which we played at four speeds into their respective fields. While training, you can try to shoot all four balls in a row at speed one, then all four balls at speed 2, and then all four balls at speed 3, and all of them at 4. Or the same backwards. Just try first speed 4, then speed 3, and speed 2, and at last speed 1. Or even you could also try a kind of half speed. You could do a mega easy speed 1 half, then 1 and a half. Then two and a half. <coughs> and speed three and a half. This was too short. And then you could try to put all balls into the two middle diamonds. This will keep you busy for a while, won't it? Andy, do you have an alternative exercise for straightness? Good. First a warning when you're working on straightness. There are exercises for straightness that we often see in billiard salons that aren't good. They are even detrimental to your playing development. Exercises where they set up balls at opposite ends of the table, and then they try to hammer them into the pocket. Exercises like that generally will not enhance your skills, rather you develop a fear of such shots. There are completely different ways to work on straightness. You can work with narrow lanes. For example, you can make lanes that a ball can easily pass through, but that look very narrow. You can make it a centimeter wider than a ball. Then you place the balls like this. And now I know that the cue ball fits through this lane. If I shoot straight, then nothing can go wrong. All I have to do is rely on my ability to shoot straight. You can construct many different situations like this, where you force yourself to shoot straight and where you can verify your success. You can also set up narrow lanes across the table, aiming for the side pocket, so it looks very narrow. But I know that the cue ball can pass through. All I have to do is do it. It may look narrow, but it is actually no problem to practice shooting straight, but they also help us to convince ourselves that we are capable of a straight shot. And that is very important. So perhaps a word about shot quality. Follow shots and draw shots. Okay. As long as we are talking about pat one, I can offer you some exercises that you can try. Place one ball here at this diamond, one ball there at that diamond, and one ball here, the cue ball at the diamond behind it, and then try, this is something for actual beginners, then try to sink the ball and let the cue ball follow. And the same, of course, here, and here. And when you can do that, one after the other, you'll probably have to attempt it a few times. 
Then you try it again, this time with the balls one diamond further back. Again as follow shots into the pocket. And the same here, and the same here. And of course you can try the same with draw shots too. Perhaps another idea for draw shots, Andy? As I said before, practicing is about convincing yourself of what you are actually capable of. Don't work with difficult shots like the one I mentioned previously, where the cue ball is right in front of the pocket and the object ball is in the middle of the table. The shot is much too difficult to practice. The chance of missing the shot is much too high. What is the use of practicing a shot that I mostly miss? It is much better to work with relatively simple exercises that supply your subconscious with essential pictures. Now we are talking about pictures again. Pictures that confirm the fact, yes, I can do that. For example, when working with draw shots, one of the questions I am often asked during training is, how far can I play my draw shots? My answer is always the same, I do not know. I don't know how far I can play a draw shot and I don't care to know. How often does something like that really happen? That my object ball and my cue ball are seven, eight or nine diamonds apart from each other and I need to play a draw shot. It is much more important to develop a feel for draw shots, a relatively simple exercise for yourself. Try to play them correctly. It's a good idea to set them up along the cushion. The advantage being that you don't have to hold the cue at such a steep angle. You can hold it very, very level. You always want to hold your cue as level as possible. With a smooth, easy stroke, we can create a lot of backspin. Those are pictures that appeal to the subconscious. You say, man, look at that backspin, I can put on that thing. The balls were not far apart, but we needed a clean shot, and we were able to come back across the whole table with a cue ball. We can practice a similar exercise, but we can increase the distance a little bit more, but not too much. These are tests for beginners. We want to get a feel for quality. We want to develop the confidence in ourselves that we can shoot a good draw shot. So don't make your exercises unnecessarily difficult. Keep the balls closer to each other. Try to develop a smooth, soft stroke with a high velocity at the end of the stroke, putting a lot of effect on the ball in order to build up your self-confidence so that you have the feeling, yes, you can play draw shots. Perhaps another alternative to the small position area well, there are a lot of exercises, but what I am thinking of at the moment is perhaps this one. Okay, uh, maybe it should be open for discussion whether it is a middle or a small area exercise. But let's place these six balls here. The cue ball in the middle. And now try to clear it in a row. I start with the first line. Clear the three balls in the first line. For this, the white one doesn't have to move a lot. It moves only in this field. And after you've cleared the first line, you change to the next one. It would be ideal to leave the cue ball in the middle, because from there you have the chance to get at each ball. And then the second line, until it is cleared. And with this drill you can of course try just the first three balls, let's say for beginners, then you do the next three balls. Then you can make it more difficult, for example, you say, I'm not allowed to touch the cushion, or I can only use the middle pockets for the second line, and just the corner pockets for this line, so you can vary the exercise. Do you still have some more for the large position area, Andy? Yes, I think that the big position area is one of the easiest to work on. 
because most of the playing situations that we are daily confronted with occur in the big position area. That means that we don't necessarily need to set up a specific exercise, rather we have to figure out what we need to work on in order to get used to playing position across the whole table. Take the time just to set up two balls far apart from each other that force us to play across the whole table. For example, I will put a ball over there and over here, and then I think about the possibilities that I actually have. It's important to get into the habit of looking for many of the possibilities that are at our disposal. Then begin with those possibilities in which you just let the ball roll, not putting any effect on the ball. Just a plain and simple shot. Then observe where the cue ball goes. Then you may often discover that just shooting the ball is enough. It is often not necessary to play as you see many so-called experts in billiard salons do it. Every ball requires an incredible amount of effect on it, incredible backspin or an incredible follow shot. That is not true. Often a simple shot will suffice. Then you can change the way you set up the exercise, the position of the ball. Good. Let's use this ball here. And I just let the cue ball roll. And now I see, aha, the cue ball does not run all the way across the table. Now I have to try something different. So now I set up the exercise similarly to the previous one. It doesn't have to be exact. Balls won't always be on the same spot in the game either. It's just that we need something specific right now. We need an angle that won't put the cue ball here, rather it has to go farther across the table. So we have learned that our kiss shot tangent would send us over here at a 90 degree angle. That looks a lot more comfortable. So we shoot a stop ball. I'm shooting with effect now. Aha, uh -huh. that looks like a better position. Now we have also learned that we can play behind the kiss shot tangent. That means it must be possible to play the same ball or at least a similar ball by playing behind the tangent. Then I could send the cue ball directly into this area. I do that by playing the cue ball a bit lower. Not bad, but we were a little too fast. We had effect on the ball, it was behind the tangent. Let's work with it now. We still need effect on the ball. A word of caution when working with such exercises. A lot of people would now start to say, oh, I hit it too hard, the table is too fast, I need to put less effect on the ball, it would be better if I shot like this. That's great. The problem is just that we didn't get what we wanted. Keep to your shooting procedure. Stick with the things we have learned and trained together. Trust your stroke. Always make a complete stroke. Always follow through. In this case, I would just reduce my end velocity. That is to say, at the end of my stroke, I don't want to have such high velocity. But I still want to play a draw shot. And see there? The ball is not as fast anymore. Get used to length and direction. Don't try to work on everything at once. My first shot was too long. I was just trying to get my direction down. The velocity didn't matter. Don't try to do everything at once. Not the right direction and not the right velocity simultaneously. Just try to get the cue ball in the right direction. And then use your stroke procedure. Take out a little bit of the end velocity. Try to maintain your direction, but play the ball shorter. Not so fast. Well, since we are talking about exercises for playing position, we could add a little follow-up program like this. We set up the object ball directly in front of the pocket and you want to find out where the cue ball goes after I've played the ball into the pocket. As long as we work with pat one, uh, for instance, try this. Try to play the cue ball through here and here. And then, when you want to go further, you could narrow the openings a bit more. Or you could put them there, which makes it a little bit more intense. I still need one ball. 
Okay, and I'm sure it'll be fun to try this. You try to sink your ball, you put the cue ball here, and then you try to play through the first gap. The trick would be to do it without any English. And then the next gap, which is between the 5 and the 11, this is a little bit narrow. Okay. And then try it between the 11 and the 2, which is a very tight squeeze. In pat 1, you would just eliminate the ball and use this gap. We'll let it stay there. Okay. And then continue from one gap to the next, which is now between the 10 and the 2. Oh, here I made my first mistake. It ran exactly to the 2. Then do it again until you get the gap. For time's sake, I'll continue here and do the gap between the 10 and the 7. Where I'm also not successful. Sorry, I guess I have to work a little bit on my game and do some more training. But nevertheless, this is a very interesting exercise to get familiar with the motion of the cue ball. And I'm sure that in other books you will find some more similar training ideas to get used to positioning the cue ball properly. Andy, what do you think? Yes, as you say, there are a lot of drills to choose from. Books are full of them. As you may have noticed, we are not really interested in immersing you in an enormous amount of stiff regiment exercises. Billiard is a game. This is about playing. Play with the things that we have been discussing. Pick out projects that you enjoy doing and that you have not yet solved and experiment with them. Keep with your stroke. When you notice that you are beginning to just push the balls around, set up your 16 balls and go through your stroke again. Make sure to maintain a clean stroke. Don't forget your seven steps. Then you're ready to go back to this exercise and play through that gap. Or even better, I want to pocket the ball and then hit that ball. That is, I don't want to send the cue ball through the gap. Rather, it should hit that ball. That means that all of these drills could have twice as many variations as you might expect. Set up situations as we had previously explained. If the ball is here, then develop an eye for the kiss shot tangents. My tangent goes over here. Find the tangent. Set up a ball on it and say, if I play a stop shot, then I must be able to hit the 11. I play a stop ball and hit the 11. Create your own exercises and develop them. For example, that would mean if I put the ball here and we find the line, and I now put my ball here, then the stop ball should go behind it. Then you can make it even worse and make the exercise more realistic and say, good, my cue ball must be able to go through all that. Become acquainted with these pictures so that you are able to discern. Yes, the ball will pass through there. It must. And then play it through. Then you will become more self-confident, more courageous. Set up tasks in the same fashion for draw shots to find out what obstacles you can avoid. Let's leave the same situation on the table and try to find out can I put enough backspin on the ball to completely get around those balls? Figure out if that is possible. Collect your perspectives. They are almost in line with each other, about one diamond apart. Can I draw that? Or which draw shot can I do that with? 
Figure out which draw shot will just get you past that ball. Which draw shot would I hit that ball with? Get used to the exercises. And when you can do them on a small scale, then you can try the same exercises on a larger scale. Then you create a new task for yourself and say, Okay, now I want to try to get my cue ball up there. Can I pocket the ball and get the cue ball up there? I'm going to have to put backspin on it to play behind the kiss shot tangent. That was too much backspin. Now I want less spin. I will play more toward the middle. That was too close to the middle. I'll play it a little lower. And now it runs in the right direction. Whether I actually hit the thing or not, that's not all important. I finally got the direction right. Give yourself tasks that you have fun doing. You don't have to be so strict with yourself and practice these three balls until it makes you sick. No, explore the game. Do you have something else to add? Okay, let's say you work with an exercise with several balls. Then don't try it again and again from the beginning of the exercise, not always from the start. Well, that may not be bad for your discipline at first, but there's a point that you reach when it would be good, when you should make a mistake, to start again at that point. Not only practicing from the beginning of an exercise, but also from the middle part or from the final part. This will help you to avoid only practicing the beginning and hardly the rest. If you want to have some fun or try more interesting exercises, you could try to play an alternative to an endless drill. You position your ball here, the cue ball you can put where you want, and then you try to sink it. You're allowed to use any pocket. Just play the ball, and then take the ball back out of the pocket, and then you see, I didn't concentrate enough. I should have taken it more seriously and should have had a much better position. So I start to compensate. And then you place the ball again, and again, always the same one, you can play that endlessly. At least, theoretically endlessly, to pocket the ball. And then there's the simple question of, how often did you succeed? Yes, you may use each pocket. This is a very simple exercise, at least it seems like it should be. Here you learn to take each ball seriously, really to take each one seriously, just a small mistake and then you have to start doctoring. How many balls can you pocket? I will stop here, but this is your task now, to find out how many balls you can make. 15 balls would be the minimum for you, let's say 20. Then you can go one step further and try a two ball endless drill. You put one ball here and one there. And you play here and there again and again. Then you can try a three ball drill like in the test and so on. Endless drills are really, as you can see from the name, they are possible in an endless variety. Andy, a little alternative perhaps before we get to the end? Perhaps about standard shots? Perhaps just one thought about this concept that I mentioned before, how apparently one should be silent when playing billiard. One should be so quiet. A little while ago I said something that seems to be a capital offense in billiard that you should speak as you're playing. People often look at me as if I were crazy because I recommend this. Yes, you can play that way. You can learn to be silent. Try speaking, speaking loud. 
converse with your training partner. You can do whatever you want. Learn to dance at the table. Learn to get your perspectives as you talk. It should happen almost instinctively. You can talk the whole time. And then you only need to be silent when you actually shoot. Then you look for your next perspective on your next ball. Choose the easy shots. You don't have to choose the difficult shots. Take the easy ones. Learn to breach your speech. That even rhymes, and whatever rhymes is good. The best way to learn that is not in your head, but rather by speaking loudly. When that works, then look for your next perspective, figure out which ball you want to play next. You can speak the whole time, it doesn't matter, and then interrupt your speech. Then you can continue your conversation after you have finished retaining the tension. This is a good exercise to warm up for a competition, to get into your stroke. You don't necessarily have to speak loud, but you can slowly, deliberately work through your steps correctly and then this moment of silence from the point of no return until you have finished retaining the tension. And then you are allowed to talk and to think anything you want to. Did I remember to close the window back at the house? Did I turn off the lights? What happens if I lose? What happens if I win? All questions that billiard players ask themselves. Do you have another suggestion? Yes, if you now want to start attending matches and even play with a team or in a league or play at a championship in your area or something like that, at least as long as you play at the first level, then it is essential to know how to start to warm up. If you have an important match or participate in a championship, then you have a certain amount of time to warm up before the match. And perhaps then it is good to have a personal routine with which you start your daily training and which is familiar to you and you feel at home no matter where you are. We have three phases of warming up before a game. Perhaps you will start this way. Phase one, just warm up, which means putting a couple of balls on the table and just playing them casually. Warming up can also mean that you stretch your muscles or something like that, uh, that your muscles warm up. But you can also accomplish this by playing a couple of balls. Okay, phase one, warming up. Phase two is to get familiar with the table. Of course, you can leave that out if you play the match at home. You try to find out what kind of table it is. To become familiar with the table, it would help to play some balls. Ask yourself questions. Is it straight? Is it level? Or isn't it? I like to play some balls along the cushions to find out whether the balls go where I want them to, straight into the pocket, or if they pull out a little bit or fall in too soon. I examine the cushions. When I want to play along the cushion, I need to know which angle is necessary there to pocket the ball. Then I find out if the cushions are the same or shorter or longer by putting the same ball next to them, so I know what to expect from the cushions. If there is enough room for two balls, then it is quite optimum in size. If we have lots of room between the balls, the pockets are generous. If two balls do not fit into one pocket, then we have very tight ones.
I also try to find out whether I can play a ball comfortably along the cushion and across the middle pocket, or do I perhaps have problems there because of an uneven edge. Then I try the same thing in the other direction. And if you're not confident enough to shoot the balls, you can just try placing them here like this and then pocketing them this way. All this is interesting in phase two, getting familiar with the table. Phase three is now what I learned from my mentor. I get into the game to get into the match. In phase three, I rack up a game, nine ball, eight ball, or 14 one, depending upon which one I have to play, and then I try to play this match. I can also place the balls on the table where I think it's good and simulate like an actor that this is the first part of the match. Yes, I actually act for myself. I think as if it were the first part of the match. This is your advantage because when the match actually starts, you have already begun and your opponent now has to begin. This is my advice to get into a game. And when you get used to this routine and do it before every match, you have something to do when you get to the table. You have a task, something to work on, and you cannot feel insecure anymore. I think it's important that when you are just learning billiard, that it is better if you don't play too many matches where winners and losers are determined. I've been in so many billiard clubs, perhaps you will agree with me here, where everything is counted and they are always playing against each other. They reason that this is the only way that you can prepare yourself for the World Cup. And that is not true. That is not the way you prepare yourself for the World Cup. Playing against each other can distract. Playing billiard with each other, together. Of course in a game as opponents, but not keeping count, no match. Only then, without this pressure, can you work on your mistakes. You can say to your partner, wow, I missed that shot, can I try it again? And then he can say, yes, of course. And then you can really begin to work on that shot. Then you are really training together. And then if you do that, you can take some time, once, twice, or maybe three times in a week, to simulate a competition. Then you try to play a serious game against each other with a high level of concentration. No fooling around. As Ralph had mentioned, we act out the role. We play as if it were a real competition. We give our best. Then we can get used to competitive situations and how well we work under pressure. I think that if you keep these things in mind, then you will improve your game. Well, I would like to say that this is unavoidable. Thank you very much. We will see you soon. Thorsten, du bist jetzt gerade 25 Jahre alt. Seit wann spielst du Billard und wie alt warst du, als alles anfing? Ich habe im Jahre 1992 im Alter von 12 Jahren mit dem Billardspielen angefangen. Wie sah dein Training in den ersten zehn Jahren aus? Und wie sieht es heute aus? Ja, als ich anfing Billard zu spielen, da war ich schon jede freie Minute am Billardtisch und ich war in der glücklichen Position, damals schon einen Trainer zu haben, der mir auch Übungen gegeben hat, was mir sehr viel gebracht hat. Ähm, mittlerweile bin ich Profi und habe leider nicht mehr so viel die Zeit, an meinen Schwächen zu arbeiten, aber wenn ich die Zeit habe, dann nutze ich sie auch intensiv. Okay, siehst du dich eher als Spieler oder Sportler? Und was macht für dich den Unterschied aus? Ich sehe mich ganz klar als Billardsportler, denn ich führe ein gezieltes Training durch. Ich arbeite an meinen Schwächen, an meiner Technik, an meiner Taktik und ähm, versuche Ausgleich zu treiben. Und deswegen sehe ich mich ganz klar als Billardsportler. Mit dem PET-System wurde ein einzigartiges und weltweit einheitliches Auswertungs- und Trainingssystem geschaffen. Wie stehst du dazu und welchen Stellenwert hat es für dich? Ich bin so sehr von dem System überzeugt, dass ich mich selbst habe ausbilden lassen zum abnahmeberechtigten Trainer. Ich selbst trainiere mit den Übungen, ich gebe die Übungen an meine Schüler weiter und finde, dass es ein ganz hervorragendes System ist. Schön. Hast du schon Feedback von anderen Profis oder Spielerkollegen bekommen? Ich habe natürlich schon vereinzelt Übungen mit meinen Mannschaftskollegen von Dragon Promotions gespielt und sie waren sehr interessiert und freuen sich schon darauf, den Test ablegen zu können. 
Welche Ziele verfolgst du nach, wenn du dir 2003 ja eigentlich schon selbst die Krone mit dem WM-Gewinn aufgesetzt hast? Was kommt danach? Also ich selbst denke, dass ich noch ganz am Anfang stehe. Ich habe auf jeden Fall das Ziel, weiter an meinem Spiel zu arbeiten, meine Technik noch zu verfeinern, noch mehr zu verfeinern, ähm, noch weniger Fehler zu machen. Das ist einfach das größte Ziel. Und äh, wenn alles gut läuft, springt vielleicht sogar der ein oder andere Titel raus.